Thank you very much. Um, so I really want to say that it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I know that we organized it, so saying that it's a pleasure sounds maybe a little bit funny. But um, it's as I said the first day, it's uh, my high school. And actually, I used to sit on this church actually up there. And uh, I used to see the games being played, the talks that were being done. So um, I feel really happy that somehow we all contributed so that we bring our passion into this beautiful campus. So really, thank you for being here today. Um, now, what I'll present to you today is a collaboration between DeepMind, uh, Google DeepMind, Oxford University of Venice, and uh, Athens University of Economics and Business. And um, I find it a very interesting story. It started a few years ago, but before we get there, I want to start with the following. We all know that machine learning uses evidence of the past to predict the future. Today, I'm going to tell you a totally different story, which is about how we predict the past. And more specifically, we're going to focus in the area of um, ancient history. And we find this very important because be without knowledge of the past, there can be no understanding of the future. So I think it's really important when we try to make all these breakthroughs that we really re remember who we are and we build on that so we can become better. So through that, we created a name for historians, which can help us predict missing texts from ancient Greek inscriptions, which is exactly what I'm going to present to you today. So Ancient history uses disciplines, uh, uh, relies on disciplines such as epigraphy, where epigraphy is the study of ancient texts, like this one. And these texts are inscribed, and they're inscribed in stone. But the problem with that is that these are stones that were written, for example, the one that you see, it was written about 2,500 years. So that stone passed, uh, passed through many, many phases. It became damaged, it may, it may have been used as a wall, or as a pavement, or suddenly appear at somebody's backyard. So it, all of them have crazy stories. But what is extremely interesting behind them is that these stones, uh, which we call inscriptions, they were written by people themselves. So it's not just his story written by the victor, uh, by, uh, by the victory, but it's also, uh, they hold a very diverse set of, of materials that they talk about. So some of them may be uh, devoted to a god, some of them uh, may uh, write how much uh, Francesco owes to me, or uh, some of them may be just a wish for the family for the future. So they give us a very, very strong and solid understanding of the society at that time. And that's what it makes them extremely unique. Now, thousands of inscriptions have survived through time. However, the study is extremely difficult. And it's difficult for the following reasons. The first one is that um, inscriptions may be damaged and their texts are totally lost. And that is a big problem because it leaves the, the question of like, okay, um, what could be there? Because just a single word may change the whole meaning of what is going on. The same, at the same time, one of the biggest pro problems that they have is also that inscriptions can be trafficked. This means that, uh, especially in countries like Greece, you may find an inscription like that while you're swimming in the sea or a piece of pottery. And I actually have a story like that from one of my colleagues that she went with uh, uh, her partner in a Greek island and while they were swimming, because they were historians and both of them knew, they found uh, a piece of pottery just on the sea. So these things can appear anywhere and we don't really know where they came from, but a difference of where they came from, it helps us rebuild history and understand it better. And last but not least, my first question when I was presented with this um, uh, with this problem was that like, sure, but why does it matter? Why, why do we need to use machine learning to predict when they were written, for example? And um, the reason is that because I was like, radiocarbon dating works pretty, pretty well. But this is a stone. So if you try to date the stone, that makes no sense as of the date that the text was written. So. The three main problems that the historian uh, has uh, during their study and an epigrapher faces uh, in their study, and that is restoring the damaged text and predicting where and when these texts were written. So 
what if we could take advantage of all the recent advances that we've been seeing in uh, in machine learning with large language models and actually try to do this jointly? And to do that, first we need a data set. But before I get there, maybe I want to share, uh, and, and since we're talking about history, maybe I want to share a little bit on the history part of this project, because it all started exactly like you are. Um, I was in Oxford and I, my favorite thing in Oxford was lunch. And the reason that uh, is not uh, because there's, there's definitely some proof that I really enjoy lunch, but it was more like not just the food, it was the people. It was my first time that I was in an environment where like I could have a chat with people that were passionate from all sorts of different th uh, fields. And what I adore in this audience is that you all come with different ideas, with different perspectives. You are doctors, you are studying particle physics, you're studying theory. Uh, that's, what, that's exactly what we need. We need to bring people together. So while I was at lunch and people were discussing from Brexit at that time to molecular physics, uh, biology, and I was sitting with a historian friend of mine who she was extremely uh, tired trying to restore some inscriptions and she was telling me all the frustration that she's going through. And immediately, as I think most of you, I have the, the science virus. Immediately when I hear a problem, I'm like, no, no, no. Problems are to be solved. We need to find a way to do this. Can we automate it? And actually, that's how this project started back in 2016 or something. And since then, we've been building on that. But the project actually goes much, uh, many, many years before that. So. I'll, uh, the first uh, the first thing to approach the project was uh, to try to understand what data there are there because as you all know if there are no data we cannot do much uh, that's where uh, that's where we need to start from so um, this was very challenging because actually the data set we ended up uh, uh, we ended up collecting um, even existed in floppy disks at some point um, it's really, I, I find it really interesting because uh, um, we actually ended up choosing Greek, uh, the Greek language, because it has lots of peculiarities and it's very interesting to study uh, from a linguistic perspective. But at the same time, um, are you all familiar with Hewlett Packard uh, printers? Okay. HP doesn't only make printers, they have the Packard Humanities Institute which actually has digitized the biggest amount of ancient Greek inscription that can be found. And that data set existed in floppy disks, then in CDs, and uh, now it exists online. But the problem with that is that it's not annotated by computer scientists, so, um, but it's annotated by historians. That means that actually, if you see a piece of HTML, that's so much better annotated than anything you'll ever see on this data set. Like they con the, the inconsistencies were insane. Um, so we ended up scraping all the data and trying to clean it up as much as I can, as much as we could. But the the, the problem the problems were many. For example, this is a, a classic um, a classic text that uh, you would find on the data set. That on the top it had the region, like where the historians thought that this text came from, and then below uh, you can see where it was written, when it was written which says init S I V A. And uh, that actually means they were written between 400 and 350 BC. So we had to write an insane amount of regex expressions to actually end up like parsing all this data into a format that actually integers, not just a string like that. Um, and at the same time, the text itself, it's extremely noisy as of like annotations. And actually the things that you see in square brackets, these are guesses by historians. So there's not even just the, the text itself that is usable. There's just guesses that we have to maybe weigh them in the data set and uh, consider that. And given that, we ended up with 70,000 texts. And when we ended up uh, having that number, I always had the question of like, but is that number even enough? It's the classic question of overfitting. So to bring this in perspective, I always like to think of, uh, to visualize numbers and not just see the number of megabytes, but actually think about it. And actually, this is the number of data sets. These are just a few data sets that were used to train uh, GPT-3. And if you account the number of tokens and convert that to number of words and then convert the number of words into A4 pages, 
uh, that would be a 50 kilometer thick book. That's a lot of knowledge. And we know that these models work well. With the data set we played with, we only account like 40 centimeter tiny book. That's probably a very, very good, uh, uh, that's probably a very, very good science book or uh, an adorable thesis, but uh, it's still nothing compared to 50 kilometers. So actually what was interesting, one of the first observations before I end up in the model is that like, what we saw, these are like all experiment runs uh, and this is the restoration accuracy in ancient Greek and Latin, the higher is better. But uh, what, what was very interesting is that when you're playing with such small data sets, just a tiny change in the parameters, these are all experiments run in a couple of weeks, just a tiny change in the parameters would totally change the curves we were seeing. Now, the first thing we tried to do uh, is uh, because the amount of text was tiny, we tried to actually uh, do as many uh, text augmentation as we could. So the first thing would be that we tried to do clipping. Like you take a full text, you clip just a part of it. Then we did lots of text masking, which is actually exactly the problem we are solving as well. Like we're trying to mask characters and we're trying to predict them. So text masking naturally is the task we're trying to solve. At the same time, we saw that the performance increased even more with standard augmentations as of like word deletions or sentence swapping. And last but not least, we, we try to do label smoothing as of like uh, when we're making predictions to avoid the model to be overconfident about it. We called our model Ethaca and we try to follow five maxims. The first one is that like, we didn't want it to be another project where computer scientists come and say, uh, yeah, we solved the problem, that's it. Uh, we have the solution because truth to be told is that we, you, cannot, we could, you cannot really solve a problem unless you work with the subject matter experts and you can share knowledge and create a common language that you can collaborate with. And that was probably the, one of the biggest challenges in this and how we end up like uh, speaking the same language over the course of years. The next thing that we really try to focus on is how to make them all explainable so that the, we don't provide to historians that like, yeah, this is the right answer because of course there's no right answer, but we can provide them with all the, and visualize the hypothesis of the model so they can use it in their own hypothesis afterwards. And most of all, what we wanted to focus on and that was uh, very important from the beginning is that we want to make everything open. Like I know that many times companies try to file patents for what they do, or they try to uh, not share the full models or maybe not make them public the way it's, we've made everything public and we try to make it as accessible to historians as we could. Now, um, what we do is that we try to solve the three tasks of restoration, um, geographical attribution and chronological attribution at the same time. So what the historian uh, does is that they come with the ancient text and they type it into the transform model we have. The problem though there is that you cannot work at the word level because, um, because words are corrupted. You cannot work at the token level because the model is just a transformer decoder where you want to have exactly the number of uh, outputs uh, coming out. So having variable length tokens would confuse that process. So we ended up concatenating character embeddings wherever they were available with word embeddings and that performed the best. Something that has been done uh, quite a few times with LSTMs in the past uh, uh, as well. At the same time, because the context windows uh, were long and we're using an increased amount of embeddings if you end up uh, working at the character level, uh, what really made a difference in the performance of our model was also using sparse attention and mechanisms like uh, Big Bird that uh, they combine uh, local, global, and sparse attention, but they're much more memory efficient and you can handle longer contexts. Now, what you see here in the figure is that Ithaca is processing uh, the phrase Dimot Athneon, which means uh, municipality of Athens. And the first three characters are missing. And as you can see, they're being predicted and at the same time, uh, it outputs a distribution for uh, where it was written and when it was written. Now, our main priority was to make Ithaca's predictions as interpretable and meaningful to historians as we could. And for this two reason, we tried to implement lots of visualizations. The first one is that we use beam search to decode from the, from the transformer head. 
and then we try to uh, we try to score by the probability which which is the most probable text. But then the question comes of like, sure, we give which is the most probable text, but probably this means nothing because the question is like, why is this the most probable text? So we tried lots of visualization tools and what it ended up working the best was saliency maps in this case, where we, we form a saliency map. Saliency map shows us um, which parts of the input contributed most to each output. So for each level uh, letter that we're predicting, we show and highlight in color to the historians uh, which parts of the input contributed the most to that. And there's a beautiful example for that, because for example, the, uh, the text that you are seeing there uh, is about an alliance that was formed between uh, the Athenians and the Thessalians. And while the word alliance is the one that is missing, while the model is while Ithaca is restoring that correctly, it attends specifically to the words Athenaeon and Thetalon, which are the two uh, parties that form the alliance. So that was fascinating for the historians, especially, and for us even more, to see that actually the model had picked up entities and had already connected them, yeah, even with such a small amount of text given. Now, at the same time, we, uh, for the other two tasks of geographical attribution, we visualize everything and we also connect it, uh, we plot it on a map. And the reason is simple is that like many places are connected by sea and not by land. And unless you have them visualized in a map, many times you, do, you cannot do, you cannot do the, these connections by yourself. And last but not least, what we're doing is that we're, we, we didn't want to predict a single date. So we treated, instead of treating them all, uh, the problem as a regression problem, where you would regress against uh, a date or a date range. We wanted to split the time that we refer to uh, in decades and treat it as a classification problem as a, a, and, um, and try to match the hypothesis of the historians, which is actually a uniform distribution over uh, a few decades, uh, and try to match that using the KL divergence. The problem now is that many times historians, this is a date bracket that you see that it's just 50 years, but sometimes uh, date brackets of here that historians give in the data set are 200 years. So that, the, 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 that can be very problematic. And one of the very interesting thing we saw here is that on gray, you see the ground distribution and with yellow, you see the predicted distribution of the model matching it very closely. However, you can see that there is a trend towards the right. So that actually is a trigger that we would give to the historians and be like, hey, actually, would it be worth maybe looking at this again in case you want to shorten the date bracket? And we have lots of this ongoing. Now, again, for the uh, chronological attribution tasks, um, we, uh, we visualize the saliency map. And that's extremely interesting because we can pick up all sorts of uh, uh, such examples where, for example, this text speaks about General Nikias and attributes it specifically at 413 uh, 13 BC, which is precisely the uh, which is precisely the, the day the date that he led the Athenian forces against Sicily, but the expedition resulted in devastating defeat. But the model actually seeing through all this text has learned to associate them both in space and time. And that we found that the outputs of that very interesting. So let's get into the results. And I think that, that this makes this and uh, this, uh, this was a big part that was spent on trying to formulate this results table. So on the first part of the table, you see the results on the restoration where the top one is the top one restoration accuracy. And what you can see is that historians by themselves, let's just take the accuracy, um, they scored around 25%. So we actually measured a few students from Oxford uh, and they were PhD students on how well they do on the restoration of texts. And then we measured the Ithaca's performance that is nearly double. But what we found fascinating is that when then we measured exactly the same students again, using the model itself. And what was fascinating to see is that actually historians that use the model, uh, not only they nearly triple the performance of themselves, but they also outper outper outperform the model itself, which is a beautiful example that like, and that is the news that we should be stressing and we should be, that's the kind of research that I feel we should be pushing forward that like, 
It's not that AI is going to take their jobs. AI is not there to take their jobs. AI is to make them more efficient into their jobs. It's just another tool. And I like to see, you know, the way that, for example, microscopes and telescopes expand the real of the realm of science. That's just another tool for them. But this is one of the first ones. Um, now, we also computed more human baselines, which is, let's take, for example, the region attribution, how historians usually approach this problem, is that they try to find what names exist on the text, and then they have a list of when these names appeared, and they try to find a smart combination of those. So this baseline is called onomastics, coming from the Greek word name. Um, as you can see, in the case of uh, region attribution, our results are nearly triple the human baseline. And at the same time, one of the most fascinating results that I find is that Ithaca is able to date texts within uh, 30 years, within less than 30 years of accuracy. And that is really impressive, given that we're talking about texts that they were later written more than 2,000 years ago. Now, The first thing we did was, uh, this was a line of work that started earlier. So the first thing we did um, was to consider what is actually right. So what we go and do is that we actually delete the text that we know that it's there, and then we give it to the model. But this comes with a catch that maybe that text appears in another text that is cross-referenced or something, uh, uh, or which is like, it's very common that this text can be formulaic. So one of the first things we try to do is that, as with every discipline, there's a book that you always refer to. And for ancient Greek epigraphers, that's Rhodes and Osborne, 2000, uh, 2003. So they had do, done some of the most impressive restorations that they're really considered grounders that they never existed before. And they, they have them on the book. So what we went there and did is that we first compared the performance with our previous model, which was Pythia and that was just an LSTM, and compared it with a, with a transformer. And of course, you can see that the performance of the transformer, as expected, is much better. Now, we had lots of data, and the historians wanted to go through all the results one by one and slowly see if they pick up something that is actually interesting and related to the work. And seeing that for me was like, no, 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 we started to automate the process Making automating just a part of it and making it manual again doesn't make any sense. That led at least to one month fight. It's not easy to convince somebody to change what they do. But it was the beautiful thing of like working together, we slowly started to develop a common language. And the common language was sometimes maybe you need an example to see to understand what exactly it is. Or so what I sat and started to do is that we're looking for uh, specific words or specific examples that the model that we know very well that the model picks up and they have impact. So what we did is a little bit complex, but I'm going to try to explain it uh, and we'll uh, get there, which is that every text, we formed it as a bag of words and every word would be assigned with the score of the prediction. If it was, uh, if it was uh, for example, how many years distance uh, was it predicted from the initial grounded ranges, or what was the accuracy? If it was miss, uh, it was not accurate. Uh, it was a not accurate prediction. We would assign to each word a zero. If it was an accurate prediction, we would assign a one. So now, then, we'd go through all of the evaluation uh, set, and in we would accumulate this course from every word. So we would create a list where we knew which words, when they appeared, the model was very accurate in the predictions, which is very interesting because then all sorts of patterns emerge. And one of the patterns we actually found was that there's a, there's a whole set of words that they're, they're related to actually uh, exchange of slaves and they were all assigned in Delphi because people would go there and ask the Oracle about that. And we found lots of patterns like that and pretty much like any inscription that has some of these words, it was always accurately predicted. Now, what was interesting is that even if we would delete these words so that we could make some kind of ablation and see like, is the model actually learning anything 
or is it just the word that it's learning and it's learning to predict it? The scores would stay exactly the same. So that meant that actually the words did affect the prediction a lot, but it was the whole context that was taken under consideration. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. I think that uh, that is the way that we should see this um, uh, these models coming up. So to demonstrate Ithaca's creative potential, we decided to apply uh, Ithaca to a contemporary methodological debate that the uh, uh, historians have. So we're in Thessaloniki, second largest city. I'll travel you to Athens because there exists a group of Athenian decrees that their dates is extremely disputed. The conventional opinion is that these texts were written 450 BC, but more recent uh, generation of historians thinks that these texts were written 440 BC. And actually the dating that our data set has uh, aligns with the old evaluations, 400 feet. And of course, you, you can look at me and be like, but Yanis, this is just 30 years of history. What's the difference? Like, is anything really changing? Think of how many things happened in the last three years. <laughs> Think of what we've been through. And I, these are even more crucial years. Actually, these were the most crucial years of Athenian imperialism, and they have uh, momentous repercussions to uh, our understanding of wars, politics of that time, and everything. These were the years of Pericles, Plato, Socrates, so just a little bit of shift changes the order of everything. So what we did is that we, we excluded this, uh, this data from the data set itself, and we retrained our model on the whole data set of inscriptions. And what we actually show is that um, when we asked the model to predict the dates and we used the new ground, the grounders of the new uh, assumptions from historians, we saw that we actually align extremely close, uh, like we're only five years away from the new grounders that were uh, reevaluated, compared to the old ground, uh, co compared to the data set itself, there was 25 years away from the new evaluation. And that, that one I find it fascinating from the following perspective is that these models can actually work. We know we have like denoising autoencoders and we know that these models have an amazing ability to digest information and compress it. And we actually see and try to demonstrate with this example that by compressing this information, you may be able to denoise it. Of course, there's not a guarantee. This is an observation afterwards. But the fact that the data set is wrong, you exclude the text, you combine all the data set itself again, and you ask them all to predict it, and it gives you a more accurate prediction than the data set itself, what existed. That's very inspiring of how we could maybe redate our history. Maybe we could, uh, we could combine all these assumptions of different people. And it kind of makes sense as well, like people to justify it. Because if you're uh, a historian, probably you specialize at a specific period of time, at a specific place. But it's, you don't interact with others at different places. And of course, a culture is shared between places because uh, there are, uh, there's a trade, there are similar religions, maybe there were colonies. So actually being able to share all this information and combine it for the first time, it leads to magnificent results. Um, now, there are lots of problems that are actually are interesting into this because we actually started a new line of work. Like nobody had tried to use deep learning, um, not just to predict OCR or uh, maybe like there are several tasks. We recently did a survey, I'll refer to that. But like this was the first big application of deep learning at that scale. Of course, the problems are many. One of them is, for example, that data circularity. There is no ground truth of uh, when something was written. We take historian assumptions and we base, we take that as the ground truth. So it's the big question: like, could we actually approach this maybe in an even more probabilistic way rather than just digesting the data? However, what we saw even using books that were considered really the gold standard, we saw that actually these models align perfectly with them. So we proceeded with our research. At the same time, Ithaca is really good, even in a data set that it's 
uh, it's very noisy, let's say, in a polite way. Uh, we saw that these models work very well into denoising things. And um, at, the same, I, at the same time, I really want to stress that everything is an assistive tool. Like, it's not an idea of, like, replacing epigraphers or something like that. Now, our goal when we started this was to make this research publicly uh, available to everyone. So we actually paired with Google Cloud and uh, the Google Arts and Culture Institute. And we tried to make a, a freely available interface, which is under ithaca.deepmind.com, uh, so that everybody can use it. Now, it's funny because it's like ChatGPT. It's, uh, people may be using it, but they will never admit that I used it to write this text. And I think it's exactly the same here, right? Like, you don't want to admit that, um, uh, that if you're a researcher, that you're using a tool to help you because maybe you're too proud or you feel, I think the times are changing in this, but we're, we're leaving the change now. So I find it very interesting, the fact that like, it's been only two papers that they've been using our work so far and they claim it, but we've seen an enormous amount of requests given the amount of historians that exist in this field which is very interesting uh, to kind of connect it. Like, I think we have uh, something about 300, I think we have something like 300 unique new queries um, per week or per month. I can't remember exactly, which is still impressive compared to the amount of historians actually working in this area and that they're active. Um, now, of course, uh, I find that this is not just the only adoption. I think I have some more statistics afterwards actually about this now that I remember. But one of the most beautiful things that came out of this research is that one day we're being tagged on Twitter under um, this, uh, uh, this amazing uh, teacher's uh, Twitter handle say, having created a beautiful video of his class. And what was his class about? It was history and AI together. Like, he was like, why should we have a, a lesson of history and a lesson of uh, computers that are separate? And he had done an amazing effort into creating a whole curriculum for the students of how to teach ancient Greek, this is in Ghent, uh, through AI. And I find this extremely inspiring because he started a Sparkle and now we're filming a video together that is going to be released in a couple of weeks uh, where we have actually 80 teachers in Europe using our model, or actually a call-up notebook that has been adapted from our model to help the students learn history, which is fascinating because it feels like it's the next uh, generation of historians uh, being trained. But at the same time, it's beautiful to see that like the, the, each teacher has about 20 kids. And even though the, this has been running for two years, that's a lot of students actually, that they have this all new mentality. Now, as I said earlier, yes. Okay, so it's been 330 new jobs that are submitted per week, which is a surprising amount, uh, as we discussed earlier. Last but not least, like, I think that all this uh, line of research uh, triggered to me maybe all my Mediterranean genes that I had inside me which is like try to understand better what are the things we can have impact and i think that this is really important like we're all going to do research if we're here i would assume but the question is that we all have limited time like it's a fact that you have just a limited uh, number of hours per day and the big question is first of all like what makes you happy to devote them and for me the answer was that i want to have impact I like to pick new problems that are not solved. And I like to pick problems that they can contribute to the greater good. And um, one of the things that this uh, whole line of work triggered to me immediately is try to understand what are the areas that someone can contribute. And actually we did a huge survey. We covered more than 500 uh, papers in the area of uh, AI for humanities and try to understand what exactly are the problems that, uh, that uh, exist there. And some of the very interesting findings were the following. First of all, the most interesting papers were the ones that uh, they were formed by interdisciplinary teams. So what I would encourage you today and for this week is that 
if you find somebody that you communicate well, but you work in different fields, give it an extra effort to try to collaborate. I, 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 I have many ideas, many, uh, I think I have many memories and uh, vivid collaborations to share, for example, with like, um, or, or even discussions that I've, uh, I've tried to help with my machine learning expertise. Uh, different people and I find them so interesting because you get an opportunity to learn also something new and um, I, at the same time I would encourage you that like if you're interested in this area of uh, AI for culture it's beautiful because you get to play with LLMs uh, whatever is being used uh, in all the big models that we're seeing today but the data set is small so the iterations uh, you don't have to wait a month, you wait just a few days to get your model back. And at the same time, because research is, uh, the momentum in the field is just growing, it's it's beautiful that you have all the spectrum that you, uh, wherever you want to create, or you want to be creative, you can just go and do it, and you'll be the first. Um, we have this survey published, and the last thing that we actually saw, and I found that very interesting, is that the biggest impact, so what you see there in the chart is actually the number of published papers and then it's the cumulative uh, number of, uh, uh, of the distribution. And what was actually uh, very interesting is that there are spikes in the, in the distribution and these spikes were caused by, uh, by workshops. Whenever there was a workshop uh, about a, a, very, a similar uh, subject, they would hold the competition. And whenever there was a competition, that was fantastic because it meant that historians had sat down and formulated the problem into a machine learning interesting way, in a, to a machine learning approachable way. And then people that were just enthusiastic about the problem, they would try to go and improve the scores. So my take home message from this was that interdisciplinary teams work the best. It's also really nice to share maybe uh, the fact that research may not be working sometimes. Uh, and at the same time, if you really like something, workshops and competitions can really make a difference in the field. So that, I, I found that very interesting. Last but not least, and I found that very, uh, this is maybe my Greek side being expressed even more, is that like it's been about 145 years since the archaeologist Schliemann brought the, the light the ruins of uh, the island of Ithaca. Now, news of this discovery soon appeared into the, into the relatively young journal at that time, Nature, which uh, would actually report on excavations as well on cities like uh, Troy, Messina, Knossos, and some of the most significant finds of modern archaeology. Fun fact, Nature had just been founded less than a decade before Ithaca's discovery. So we can hardly claim that Ithaca is the first work bringing together the realms of science and antiquity. But returning to Ithaca, we hope that this road is a long one, full of adventure and full of discovery. So as I told you in the beginning of the presentation, uh, with Ithaca, we used machine learning to predict the past. Then again, history has this uncanny tendency to endlessly repeat itself. So you could argue that Ithaca is actually another way of predicting the future, showing us yet again how culture, history, and machine learning are lastingly entwined. Thank you for your attention.